Whew, we survived the flood. <laughs> I might be a little waterlogged. Just in case you were wondering who survived, it was Noah and his eight and uh, Michael and Daniel. So, <laughs> Hello, everybody. Here we are, Sunday of the 2024 Calgary Grace Conference. We hope you're enjoying the session so far. And uh, I hope that our journey through time uh, has been fun for you. I enjoyed last night's session sharing oh. with you about time and how God used time, the structure of time, to tell his story, to play out the plan and the purpose <clears throat> and his will. And uh, here we are at the end of time, the age without end, enjoying yeah. the wonderful benefits of everything that the story told of. You know, Daniel, I, I, you addressed something that uh, contains the contextual answer that nobody on earth has or has had before you shared it with them, and that is the end of time, mm. uh, the fullness of time. Yeah. Uh, the, what a tremendous uh, insight uh, to be able to have not only know that the cross is not only the fulfillment of time and also the uh, fulfillment of all prophecy, all law, the end of sin. It's a brand new world. Yeah. And as uh, it is, I'd have to say, as brand new as we've been trying to uh, convey to you that the world was after the flood. And there was, it was tremendously, I mean, they must have just walked around going, <laughs> I mean, for for yeah. years, just going around looking like, oh my God, look at this, look at that, uh, because the the transition was uh, uh, amazing. Now, um, the uh, the thing about the transition that happened after the cross, this is all internal. So, uh, if you're going to look, and if you're going to awe, you're going to have to look back at the Hebrew scriptures. And track this to see the conditions, the, the these transitions and these changes were all there to help us understand the great and final uh, uh, transition that would be the end of time. Mm. That time would come to an end in a relationship. You see, uh, uh, time is one of those things, if measured between you and God, means there's a God and you that's separate. So there is no more time. Yeah. Time is gone, just like prophecy's gone, law's mm -hmm. gone. Time is just another one of those things that was used to measure distance between God and man, and uh, that's uh, you know that's what we're still trying to feel out and to have some concept of is where are we? <laughs> uh, but to learn where we are, how many of you agree we have to learn where we are not? Mm -hmm. So uh, last night you learned a great deal more about where we are not. And um, uh, what, a, what a tremendous thing to be able to understand. You got to hear uh, what the end of time is. Yeah. Goodness gracious. Wow. And, you know, about that's the big debate that is had about evolution versus creation is time. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy how that came together is understanding that God used time and he shows us the time frame that he used. And it's it's uh, it's it's logged mm. in this historic book called the Hebrew Scriptures and in Genesis, and he tells us, and the time is very important. I mean, we have all the ages of these people, and when they had their kids, and what year it was when these things happened, and God used that time to to, to do his work. And uh, evolution now comes in and says, eh, we'll just give it whatever time we want. Yeah. You know, million years, eh, okay, <laughs> let's throw a billion at it. And uh, they use that, and then because of that idea that was presented, now, all of a sudden, we see that they tried to fit their own narrative with their own. They, science tries to say, well, yeah, so-and-so said it was a million years. So, hey, here's the science for it. Yeah, and a million years is a, is a short, brief period of time in the evolutionary story. Mm -hmm. uh, and believe me, all of their uh, measurements of time 
vary from each other a great deal. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the video that we have recommended to you, but uh, very sincerely and earnestly, I mean, they found um, the uh, uh, remains, as they have many times, of uh, what is considered prehistoric uh, animals that were said to be millions of years old. And yet in this one, they actually found where that the uh, the genetic material was still elastic. It was mm. still there. Uh, the cellular level was was actually there. And uh, they're, they are doing their best to try to share this information with the other, and I'm just going to go ahead and say it, the other pseudo-scientific. Uh, because if you are not considering uh, the uh, Hebrew uh, scriptures as the real main source of the history of the human race and the earth and uh, all of it, you really are de uh, dabbling in a pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. And uh, because this science is being validated uh, constantly by the pseudoscience, because they do have scientists that are looking in and examining things, and then uh, uh, many of them being true to themselves and to their work are finding out that the study, as we've already shared with you, but has to be repeated uh, because this is not something that is going to change overnight. Uh, but when uh, the uh, very existence of the human genome now uh, is telling them that we all started from one set of parents and uh, we explain to you also the reason why are their mass um, mass extinctions figured into the history of this. Well, they have to have mass extinctions because the uh, DNA and also just the count, just the, the, the pure math of it all takes you back uh, approximately 6,000 years to where that there would have been uh, a couple of hundred people on the planet. It's, it's just there. It's the numbers. So the reason mass extinctions came up, well, Mike, the reason they came up with mass extinctions, uh, uh, just like the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs uh, became extinct uh, uh, like that. And that's another thing they don't take into consideration, that these bones aren't spread out all over a boneyard. This was a mass, sudden, catastrophic extinction and uh, that took out the dinosaurs. And, but now because they can't get anything, they can't get anything to measure mankind going back past approximately 6,000 years, they have to come in with a mass extinction to say, oops, here's where it all started all over again. And well, well, you've only got 6,000 years, so what do you do then? Well, we've got another uh, uh, man on, on the, uh, the planet for uh, an awful long time, and then there's another mass extinction and another mass extinction. Uh, but they don't acknowledge the, the uh, flood. Uh, some of them do kind of because they've got to figure out something that caused this, uh, this real and live uh, mass extinction that took place. That graphic that was shown in that video, there's a graphic in there where you have the fossil is laid out and you have not mm -hmm. just the bones of the animal, but you have the very footprints of the animal are laid out right there too. Footprints in the very same fossil uh, uh, evidence that, that the bones are there. Uh, when they're trying to say that these periods of time between the footprints and the actual animal's extinction was millions of years apart. Mm. I mean, it, he moved slow, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Big guys, but they moved awful slow. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now uh, we're laughing about it, but we know they laugh at us, so why can't we laugh at them, okay? <laughs> um, uh, because they are going to listen to this, and they're going to have a big laugh about it, uh, no doubt. But the, but the fact of it is, is that the uh, book of Genesis is at least worthy of consideration, considering that uh, many of the things that they find has only been, already been documented in the book of Genesis. And even the, the, uh, some of the prophets spoke of some of these things. 
uh, in even more detail later on. I like that part uh, passage in Job when Job is kind of arguing with God and God looks at him and says, where were you yeah, <laughs> when exactly. I laid the foundations of the earth? Where yeah. were you when I stretched out the skies with the uh, span of my hand? <laughs> where were these guys when God was doing what he was doing? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the issue here with the gospel revolution, we just simply want to know the truth about whatever this is. And uh, our uh, want to haunt has been uh, the Hebrew scriptures and for all the reasons that we've stated previously and repeatedly as to why the Hebrew scriptures to us have become important. Uh, now, as, and as we have shared with you, the uh, genealogy that is melded into this. Mm. Uh, and we've shared with you uh, in times past that we've shared with you about even uh, Solomon's line after David that Jesus is a descendant through the line of Solomon, but that Solomon's line was cursed from ever holding uh, that uh, position again uh, uh, in uh, as as far as uh, the descendants of Solomon, but the fact of it was is that the replacement of that seed then, uh, the disqualification of being in that position for Jesus was replaced by the fact that he was then the son of God. Mm. Uh, so the, the detail of this is, it's uh, and and think about the time frame. They didn't have computers sitting there saying, "Oops, we better cross reference that and cross reference this mm -hmm. and this and that." This was recorded as it went, and it is flawless. <laughs> and <laughs> sorry, I said that. Anyway. Um, so, uh, but it is it is flawless, and the uh, each of the lines. Uh, it's just amazing uh, what has happened. Uh, I think there's a couple of things, Daniel, that we touched on that uh, that deserve, as we move on into this, these last couple of sessions that we have, we uh, have a couple of things that deserve uh, a mention again. And uh, that is the, our, our uh, discussion with you about the Ringwoodite and mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the video that you looked at, or at least you have now at your disposal, is seeing that uh, strip that goes around the entire planet, just just 300 miles. And uh, after Daniel and I finished that session, we started looking at this a little bit closer. And uh, I found out something that I did not know. And that that is, because I was thinking, wow, 300 miles, that is pretty deep. And, uh, but Daniel was mentioning how that that wasn't that deep. And so I thought, well, I, I guess we need to find out how deep deep is. <laughs> and and that's when we found out that the center of the earth is 4,000 miles from the surface. Mm. 4,000 miles. So uh, 300 miles into the crust of the earth uh, really is a relatively short distance. This is uh, this uh, strip that goes around the entire uh, earth, which uh, the scientists that have gone into this say contains at least minimally the same amount of uh, water that is in the oceans currently and possibly as much as two times or more uh, that is contained in this. Now, all we did is learn about water in another form. So we know about uh, we know about water uh, sitting in your glass. We know about uh, water uh, that freezes. We know about uh, ice. We know about vapor. We know about all of these different conditions. We know about the water that can uh, be like a river in the sky in clouds. And we also were able to conceptualize then the ocean in the sky that was there before uh, the flood. And also this ocean that was contained within the deep. Now, it, we found it interesting that this was called a hydration dehydration area. So uh, the, the concept is there that regardless of how much water there was on the earth, uh, people would say, well, where did it go? Well, if this is a hydration dehydration area, 
which as you uh, uh, looked at, you can look at on the video and they describe that, then uh, for this to balance out, uh, a lot of this water could have gone back to this dehydration area deep mm -hmm. within 300 feet below the earth. Uh, don't know how that would have happened, but uh, water always flows to the lowest point. If it was possible for it to get uh, deposited there, then it would have. Uh, especially after all of the the uh, uh, what the scientists call the Pangaea uh, uh, breaking up and splitting up and the mountains coming up. And you can see it. You, all you have to do is walk out. I mean, if you live in New Mexico, go out and look and see at, and how the, those rocks, the slabs go up sideways. And you can tell that this was not something that happened over millions of years. Uh, this was something that happened very quickly in a different form and then solidified where it is. It's just very clear. And even in the video that you were able to watch about the Grand Canyon, the, uh, the one part that really amazed me was where that they showed that uh, curtain of rock that what had to be molten at the time of some kind and went through all in one piece uh, went through uh, like a million years of history, mm -hmm. according to the layers. But you can tell that this piece, whatever formed it, formed it all at one time. So there's holes in the theory. Uh, please remember that evolution is still a theory. It is not a science. Now, people will get mad at you for saying that. But the fact of it is, it is still called the theory of evolution and that uh, Einstein's uh, uh, so-called science is still called, uh, it is still called a theory, the theory of relativity. Uh, so, um, goodness, there's just so much more to learn. But we think that what we've done is uh, helped you to be able to have a concept of this. Uh, was there anything about that in that uh, discovering that ring, would I? Daniel, that uh, caught your attention? Well, of course, uh, the Bible passage that comes to mind, and we shared that too, is the fountains of the deep. And uh, that is what we're saying. This ringwood is where that fountains of the deep within the uh, a subterranean level, uh, where the source of this water could come from. I mean, that's according to the Bible story. And then it, the Bible also says that they it broke up. Uh, that it broke up. So that's where you can see this movement of land, this this mass uh, uh, amount of water coming out from the earth. And then also uh, on the other side of that too is the uh, rain that came from the heavens, that the heavens were opened like a window. Oceans, of, uh, an, an ocean, that we had an ocean inside the earth and an ocean in the atmosphere mm -hmm. above the earth. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, it, it really is, uh, quite amazing, uh, to realize that these things, uh, they, the, the one of them, of course, the ringwoodite that exists today, it's, right. it's there. Uh, the thing that we don't have is the oceans in the sky. I would really like to understand how much on any given day, uh, that the uh, planet Earth has of these, uh, of the amount of water that we have in the skies and in this. Uh, so there's a transition zone from there to the surface. But uh, this is always in course constant flux. We're not going to give you a science lesson on evaporation and, and all of that. But uh, this never escapes its ecosystem uh, system. Sism. Yeah, sism. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> uh, the, uh, it never escapes that system. And uh, there's, there's just so much of this that science backs this up. This is scientific. This is not a belief system. We've not talked to you a thing about a belief whatsoever. Um, the, uh, the first rainbow, goodness gracious, um, the uh, why would there have been a first rainbow? You know, and it doesn't explain this. You have to be, uh, you have to kind of know the story as to why there would have been a first rainbow mm -hmm. after the flood. Yeah. It doesn't go through and try to try to uh, feed you, you know, spoonful at a time explaining all of it to you. 
Uh, the only thing they knew in many cases was this is what happened. They may not even have known the connective uh, tissue, if you will, from one point to the other, because the only thing they were doing is experiencing and writing it down, experiencing and writing it down and taking those instructions that God was telling them about what uh, to write down. But the, the logic that why would there have been a rainbow the first time? I don't care when you do it. If you put sunlight through a water drop, you are going to get a rainbow. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all there is to it. There is only one reason there would not have been a rainbow before, and that is because there was sun wasn't shining through raindrops all that time. This stuff is incredible. Yeah. Um, and is very descriptive and confirming of the world the way it was. Mm. But an incredible transition took place. Yeah, and that was another thing we talked about is the atmospheric difference. And that is because all of this water that surrounded the earth in an ocean outside in the sky uh, came down. And because of that, how it was mm. before the flood and how it was after the flood is how you can see the very difference between the 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 long life that the people lived the size of these animals that they yeah. got and all of that can be explained by understanding what it was like before the flood compared to after the flood yeah the atmospheric conditions that would have uh held to the reason that people lived that long uh the uh, uh gosh i have visited a a, a nuclear uh, facility before and I remember taking the tour and I remember them walking us over this bridge that, uh, that was a, a huge vat of water. It was massive and you could see it was very clear, very, very clear water, but you could see these metal rods that were just lined up one right after the other uh, just under the surface of this water. And they explained to us that there was enough radio act, uh, or uh, radiation that was in those rods to kill anybody and uh, that came in contact with it. And it's like we were all kind of taken aback. We were, what are we doing standing here looking at it just under the surface of the water? And they explained to us that they, they either encase it in concrete or they just put water over it because mm. water is a natural barrier to radiation. So the number one thing that they uh, tell us today is the thing, number one thing that causes aging is the radiation from the sun. So you see uh, everyone, uh, every living thing would have been protected from that radiation. It was just a completely different ecosystem and that would have supported life to go on living, uh, whether it was a lizard uh, which grows throughout its lifetime, uh, or a human, which uh, before and after the flood only grows to a certain point. Uh, uh, even if they're big people, they only get to a certain height and then that's uh, our size and then that's it, unless you keep eating. I guess that's <laughs> uh, then uh, everything can change. Uh, but so uh, these are uh, these are basics, basics, basics. We are not scientists. We do not know anything. We're not claiming to know anything. We're just telling you what others know and scientists who have done this work. And we've also given you our homework and uh, what we have looked at and where we have researched and you go and you can look at that yourself. Um, uh, Daniel, as we, before we move out of that, uh, there's uh, one thing that we started looking at was uh, I started uh, wondering about the Stone Age and the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. And, mm. and uh, so Daniel and I started doing some research in that. Daniel, uh, can you catch us up on that a little bit? Well, sure. Of course, the, the accepted idea in the non-Christian world about the Stone Age is that uh, it, it's basically a mi million years ago or so. Uh, some of them concluded down to just a, a measly hundred thousand years. Um, but this is a period of time. And then you have the Bronze Age, which comes into play about uh, 3300 BC. Um, and then after that, then you come into this Iron Age. Um, and, you know, this, this issue of time, I mean, this is something that's been coming up all weekend for us here is understanding time. And um, just want to refresh your memory that 
if you did get a chance to watch that video about is Genesis history, one of the things they talk about in there is that even Darwin, he was looking for an answer to understand time. And he came across a writ writing by uh, Charlie Lyle. And Char Charlie is one who uh, proposed this idea that uh, this has all happened over millions of yeah. years. And that was Darwin's, uh, he accepted that, uh, that theory he accepted mm -hmm. as fact and fed it into his theory, which brings us to where we are today. So this expansion of time is, again, as we've been saying over and over again, these are just theories that people have had over the years. And now modern science is disproving many of the, much of this. Yeah, Charlie Lyle, you know, thank you. Uh, but you, uh, he wrote a book. This is one man's opinion about these things. Yeah. And uh, then uh, what Darwin did in trying to figure out the species is take that and he stretched that out over this man's concept. So these are two theoretical concepts mm -hmm. that were uh, that were put together, and then guess what? Now that the the uh, the theoretical all he was did uh, the only thing Charlie did was dealing with the theoretical uh, existence and the time of the existence of the Earth, and that was all. Darwin came along and and uh, superimposed over that the uh, the origins of the species. And now, because you have uh, Lyle's work and Darwin's work, now you have archaeologists going out and they've been told, here's the paradigm, mm. right? Yeah. So when they go looking, then they uh, uh, begin to, to uh, uh, place these things Try to they their attempt is to try to put it in what they have been told was science. This is but both of these are still theoretical. You would say, Mike, but why that is it that you cannot accept uh, about carbon dating? Well, carbon dating, folks, is all based on the stored up radiation uh, in an object, and then the release of that over time. And uh, I would I would say that carbon dating could be correct all the way back to the flood, but anything that went through the flood and then uh, uh, would have had this incredible super saturation because see it wasn't just rain that came down, folks. This was acid rain, if you will, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this this rain was uh, uh, saturated with what it had held back of the radiation of the sun. Mm -hmm. I don't know the science. This is just the common logic that one would have about such a thing, being that we know that these things are correct. So uh, uh, dating uh, by uh, measuring these things, by not acknowledging the fact that uh, the, the first rainbow showed up, you know, uh, 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 all of these, all, all this amount of time, how long was it from uh, uh, Genesis 1 to the flood? About, uh, about 2,000? Two, about 1,600 years. Yeah, okay, about 1,600 years. And then we've had since then, and um, that uh, things have been in the same environment. So, yes, you can figure out uh, things that are environmentally uh, correct. I remember many years ago reading articles about this, and uh, they had uh, decided that they were going to, they knew that uh, radiation and the exposure to radiation had a lot to do with the way that this, whichever one of them they were using, I don't know, remember now which one they were using, whether it's carbon dating or not, but whichever one they were using, they had a live dog that they exposed to radiation and then uh, clipped some hair from him and did carbon dating. And they said he was about 2000 years old. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, so when it comes to these uh, measurements of time that uh, people have tried to come up with, the thing that you, uh, 
the thing that we have to resolve is these things are very unstable and they all disagree. There's, there's quite a few of them now that are out there. But one of the best ways to determine, most scientists will agree with this, one of the best ways to determine the passage of time is the amount of silt that has built up at the end of major river tributaries into the oceans. And uh, the, uh, they've tried to apply those models to the amount of silt if the river had been there, if the Mississippi River had been there, you know, a million years or whatever. Um, but, uh, or, or the Amazon or any of the uh, big major tributaries around the world. Uh, but if they had been in existence, they know the average amount of silt and built up that comes out of the river into the ocean. And uh, I remember reading that many years ago, can't tell you where to find it now, uh, but that the uh, built up of the silt coming from the rivers would absolutely have built almost a mountain of mm. uh, blockage there uh, going into the ocean. So there would have been many, 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 many uh, routes for the water to have to take to get around its own debris after millions of years. Uh, that just makes sense. Um, you say, Mike, how can you prove that? I can't prove anything. Uh, there's, this is, but, but if you stop and think about it, it doesn't have to be proven. This just makes sense that this would have, uh, taken place. And if we measured the way things are measured today, that that indeed would have, would create major complications with one of the most basic things on the earth. And that's just the buildup of silt at the end of uh, the mouth of a river into the oceans. Um, one of the things we did also was taking this uh, measurement. Now they had, they had, of course, what the Stone Age was. And uh, the Stone Age, it came before the Bronze Age. So let's draw this line here. And uh, so I was doing some uh, research about uh, the Bronze Age. And then uh, uh, Daniel was also doing the research about the Bronze Age. Uh, uh, one of us was doing, uh, what, uh, the Bible had to say. And then the other one was doing what the scientists have to say. And, uh, we found out in the Bible when the bronze age started, you know, the Bible records Genesis records the beginning of the bronze age. Wow. And the, uh, and also science records the beginning of the bronze age. Daniel, fill us in on that. Yeah, so the Bronze Age comes into play uh, right around the year 3300 BC. Um, now, we have a character in Genesis chapter 2, and now this would be um, Cain's fifth great-grandson. Mm -hmm. So we, again, the power of the genealogies that are uh, laid out here in the Bible. Uh, uh, his fifth great-grandson was called an instructor in bronze and iron. And that's recorded in Genesis 4.22. And so we see that, you know, the big event that took place mm -hmm. between Cain and Cain and Abel, uh, they estimate that that was around 3700 B.C. So about 400 years difference, but now we have the fifth great grandson from Cain. And he is the one that's attributed in the Bible genealogies as being one to instruct in bronze. And so the people that are doing archaeology, what did they tell us about when the Bronze Age started? About 3300 BC. How about that? <laughs> now these, the, now neither one, it, the, the Christian side doesn't point this out mm. and neither does the uh, archaeological side point this out. We're the first ones to tell you this. We want your money. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it is just amazing to realize that the Bronze Age and its origins in the book of Genesis is exactly the same time period that the archaeology gives to the Bronze Age. Now, the problem is, is that before the Bronze Age, that is uh, supposed to have been the Neanderthal uh, Age. So we would have had the Neanderthals 
would have been doing the stone work. Leave, leave me the stone, you know. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what a Neanderthal. But uh, just in 2023, do you know that DNA determined that Neanderthal is not a pre-human? That Neanderthal was a human. So then uh, that puts Neanderthal in this category of pre-flood people where the genetics had, because he has all the same genetics as the, as the human, but they said there are chemical differences in this and this makeup. But as far as the human DNA, uh, it's, he's human. He's not a pre-human. He's not a, uh, a, a creature that showed up before humans. And that places him exactly in that time frame. Uh, and then we have the uh, beginning of, uh, uh, of, of this uh, amazing time of the Bronze Age. Uh, and then, of course, later on, the, uh, the, the flood. And uh, have I told all that right, Daniel? Yeah. And so the, the understanding there is that this Neanderthal, who apparently, you know, uh, for a million years or so, has only been able to develop the capacity to mm. strike a couple rocks together. Uh, but then all of a sudden, here in recent history, going back 3000 BC until we are now, that we have over 5,000 years developed as we have. Unbelievable. Being human. <laughs> and so, you know, this whole thing, they have fit the Stone Age into s expanding that before the Bronze Age. And they've made it millions of years because mm -hmm. they had to, because it had to fit that narrative. And the same yeah. thing true is with the Neanderthal. But what they do with Neanderthal then is say, is finally they've been proven. Uh, but, but see, their, their uh, ace in the hole, if you will, was that Neanderthal was subhuman and therefore not creative like we are. Mm -hmm. But he was everything that we are. Just better looking. His <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, that uh, does not explain why if, the, if Neanderthal was a... Uh, uh, was existed during that time, why didn't he do anything more than play with rocks? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, surely he had had a good idea. Uh, you know, maybe the first time he saw somebody stumble over a rock, you know, <laughs> let's, let's make, maybe we need some shoes. Who knows what they should have come up with. But uh, to, uh, to ascribe that much time to a group of people, human beings, the, where that there is absolutely no record, uh, according to them, no record of any progress made whatsoever until the Bronze Age. Uh, but uh, we uh, have, uh, like I said, we've just identified uh, uh, within 24 hours before going on the air here with you. Uh, we have found this, uh, the research, uh, in the archaeology and also the uh, verses in the book of Genesis that identify the Bronze Age. The other thing we happen to find by accident along looking at that is when the first writings came on, uh, mm -hmm. when they uh, attribute the first writings to come on about 3000 B.C., um, <laughs> it's all lining up, Michael, to the, and, and this is, this was not Christian research. This is, no. this is secular research, uh, the scientific world. And this is what they've shown. And it just all lines up with what Genesis tells the story of. Yes, it really does. So, um, now, uh, from there, uh, we are going, I got a blank <laughs> So we've kind of looked at so far the um, the earth, the creation. Mm -hmm. uh, we have talked about man, but now as we kind of ended our session last, um, it would have been yesterday afternoon, Saturday afternoon session, is about all the people and how the people now start telling the story. So we have creation, which tells the story, and we see how... God used the ages. God used time to tell the story and how he laid it all out. Um, I remember a couple of years ago listening to the Gospel Revolution. I think this was before I was mm -hmm. uh, working with you. 
And I remember Don doing a session where he started talking about the names of all of these people yeah. and how the names begin to tell the story. And uh, that shows into this idea that we presented to you about the genealogies, how important the genealogies are. And we have one recorded in Matthew and one recorded in Luke. One goes starts with Abraham, the other one starts with Adam. And how the, each one of these characters uh, play a part in God's plan. Now, in last night's session, I talked a little bit, and Michael talked about it yesterday too, about this predestination, about how all of this before the cross, every person before the cross was preordained and predestined to be born when they were born, to die when they would die, to be named the name that they were given, to do what they did. All of this was laid out. And it was all within this structure of time before the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. and Because it, it all pointed to Christ. It all pointed to Jesus. And uh, so, uh, Michael, I think as we go on here, what if we share some of the meanings of these names and how they tell the story? Well, uh, uh, Daniel, the, as Don went through it, and he admitted to us that he only went through just a, a little bit, and everybody was very impressed. Now, Don told us where he did his research from and uh, how he got that. So what we did is go to that same place and uh, pick up on the research that Don did. So I think Don would be very pleased that we have uh, done this. And uh, this goes through the names of, of is it the entire lineage? Um, a lot of it. It's it's not uh, complete. It's more than what Don did in his, but it's not, again, the, okay. the complete every name. So the strange thing that if you uh, ever looked up, what does that uh, what does that name mean? Because we know that names meant something. Uh, uh, and uh, when you look up uh, something uh, like Methuselah, and it means uh, his death shall bring. What does that mean? Mm. Well, by standing alone, it doesn't mean anything. And some of them, you look it up, and it just means it is appointed. It means, and it's just these little fragments, almost fragments of sentences, was the uh, definitions of their names. Now, there's no place in the, in the Hebrew scriptures that says, now go back and read all those together. Right. It's just there. Yeah. Just like many of the things just uh, that we have shared with you, there's no instructions in there to go back. Aha, uh -huh, see now why? Do you see why there was no rainbow until uh, after the flood? There's nothing that instructs you of that. It's just there as factual information. Now, what that does is prove that the people were giving the information they were given at the time, even though it may have seemed disjointed from everything else, God knew that in the recording of all of this, that just as Daniel is going to read this, I want you to stop and conceive this reality that what you're about to see God himself knew someday somebody would look up all of these names and read their definitions in line and put the story together. So uh, this really is quite amazing. So uh, I'm going to have uh, Daniel just to begin to read through these. How do you want to do this, Daniel? Well, I just want to give the credit to where credit is due. This is from a website called Bible-Codes.org. Mm -hmm. If you go to Bible-Codes.org and look up the Bible names, and you'll get this document that I'm looking from. Um, it's got this broken up into the sections. So this first section is God through Noah. So as Michael said, just think about how all of this was, this is 1,600 years of human history. Mm -hmm. This is 1,600 years of names that were given. So Noah was given his name 1,600 years before, after uh, Adam was named. and But yet all of these names come together mm -hmm. to tell a story. Yeah. So this is uh, starting with God down through Noah. The God, man, is appointed. A mortal man of sorrow is born. The glory of God shall come down, instructing that his death shall bring those in despair, comfort, and rest. Now that is... That. Now, uh, folks, that's the gospel mm. from God to Noah. 
And, but the story that's told here is about Christ. Yeah. This is mind boggling that the entire story of Christ is told in the definitions of the names from God to Noah, starting with the flood. Uh, comfort and rest uh, is the very last. That's what Noah's name means, mm. is comfort and rest. Uh, shall come down is uh, Jared. Uh, uh, the glory of God is... Uh, which one is that? Mahalo. Mahalo? Mahalo. Yes. Mahalo. Mahalo. <laughs> he, he was Hawaiian. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the glory of God. That is for sure. Uh, I've been there a couple of times. The glory of God shall come down. So here between God and, and the flood, <coughs> between Adam and the flood, God, Adam, and then all the way to the flood, we have the entire story of the coming of the Savior and the results of his visit thousands of years before it happened. Wow. Now we're going to go from where to where. Uh, this will be Shem to Terah. Now Terah would be the father of Abraham. Okay, so from the flood up to Abraham. The fame of Babylon's fortress and sorrow extend like a plant beyond the place of division, uh, referring to the Tower of Babel. A friend also branches out enraged with fury. Wow. So this came, brings us up to, um, uh, uh, that one was? Uh, Tara, which brings us to, that's Abraham's father. To Abraham. Yeah. All right. So the, then you have this extension. Of course, Abraham is the, the beginning of the promise of, uh, the, of everyone uh, being made righteous. Remember, as we learned just recently, uh, when uh, Ethan did his uh, teaching on this and uh, brought out something very that's been there all the time, but the promise to Abraham about the righteousness was while he was yet uncircumcised. So the promise did not uh, go to, uh, the promise wasn't made to the circumcised world. It was sealed through circumcision, but the promise itself was given to the whole world mm. in uncircumcision. Wow. So then we go through uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, this next slide that I want to read from, uh, it also uses six names that are tied in with the Levite priesthood. Now, we understand that that's not Jesus' bloodline, uh, but I wanted to show you, they wanted to show you here how this still tells the story and how even these Levites and how their lives were predestined. Mm -hmm. So we'll start with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then we're going to go in through uh, Moses and into who would be his grandson, Shabuel. Sh Shabuel. <laughs> <laughs> Abraham, a glorious father who became Abraham, the father of a multitude laughs as he outwits his enemy. A mighty prince sees God, then joins himself to an assembly, a glorious people whom he rescued, strangers in a strange land, captives delivered by God. <laughs> and each one of those, there's a name and just, and, and each one of those names in the Hebrew that uh, all Daniel is doing, he's not reading you the name. He's just reading you the definitions of the name in a, uh, a joined uh, from definition to definition, which uh, oddly enough makes sentences. <laughs> Amazing. So now we'll pick up back to Jesus's bloodline. Uh, so Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then we have Judah. And this is this one's going to be Judah down through Rehobin, uh, which would be David's grandson. So we're going to include David in here too. One who praises the Lord break open breaks open a way into an area surrounded by a wall, a great height. O oh, my people who belong to the prince, a prophet clothed with strength, who serves the Lord is here. Then David's name, one well loved, peaceful and who sets the people free. Mm. Uh, I, again, just astonishing. I mean, we could stop and go through any of these lists and uh, expound on them. And they, I'm sure that their lives uh, 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 really demonstrate the 
definitions of their names. And then uh, we'll look at Abijah through Manasseh. My father is the Lord, the healer of him whom the Lord judged and whom the Lord raised up. The Lord took hold of me and the Lord is strong. Mighty is the Lord. My strength and help are in the Lord. The Lord is perfect. I took hold of the strength of the Lord. It made me forget my misery. Mm. And then it goes on, Ammon through Zerubbabel. Truly I am the master builder whom the Lord healed, whom the Lord raised up, whom the Lord upholds. He did uphold and he will uphold. I have asked about the ransomed of the Lord, the exiles who are in Babylon. I want you to remember uh, this one, which uh, takes us through this story. Uh, uh, Amon uh, was uh, truly, I am the master builder. Now this mm -hmm. is talking about, of course, this, this is all the story of Christ. And uh, the, remember the mistranslation that we found in 1 Corinthians, uh, where it seemed to say that, yeah, yeah, Jesus, but I, then uh, Paul said, I'm the wise master builder and another man builds thereon. But we looked at that in the context and actually then the Greek words also, and we found out that is completely uh, uh, incorrect that uh, he refers to Jesus as being the wise master builder <coughs> and that he and all others had to take heed how they built because no other foundation can be laid than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, mm. which shows up in this genealogy. To see, this genealogy here and their definitions would have uh, d demanded that we correct that mistake in 1 Corinthians but we did it before. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one here goes through Abuad, Abuid, and then down through Jacob, Joseph, and then we finally see Christ. And then the very last one I'm going to read is the church. My father is glorious. My God will raise up a helper. The just one will the Lord raise up. My God is my praise. God will help. May the gift of Jacob, the one who grasped the heel, Increase in greatness, Emmanuel, for God is with us. Jesus, the Messiah and Savior of the called out ones, the church. Uh, yes. And when uh, Daniel read through this the very first time, the one thing that we had to acknowledge is that none of these, none of these people are, and these names of each of these had any choice whatsoever in being a part of this. Mm -hmm. And yes, that includes the church, which was birthed out of Christ. And just the same as Christ was predestined to be born and all of his ancestry before him, then all of the world was predestined to be in Christ and be called the church afterwards. You can't change the story at the very end and may turn it into your own denomination. Wow. Mm. Um, Michael, I'm just, uh, this has really been great. I mean, everything that we've gone through, um, again, as being lovers of the Hebrew scriptures, um, and all of this is just pure Hebrew scriptures mm -hmm. <laughs> and just going in and letting the Hebrew scriptures speak for itself. Uh, I, I'm just in awe. Uh, the names, uh, how science now is agreeing with uh, the Hebrew scriptures. Um, this this is just wonderful. It's like God knew what he was doing or something. Almost like that. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> and, and to think that people are just trying to throw this away and just say, ah, you know, it's just man's idea. Uh, it, that's just foolish. It's just, it's, it's stupid. It is stupid. <laughs> Uh, the, and, and we've, uh, uh, Daniel and I talk for many, many hours and try to understand what's going on. What are we doing wrong? What are we, are we doing something insufficient? Are we not, uh, uh, communicating well enough? We look at ourselves, uh, first and very critically. And, um, sometimes Daniel's more critical of me than I am of him, but, uh, probably deserved. <laughs> you guys know better than that about Daniel. Uh, he can, he couldn't be critical of a dog at bidding. Um, so, uh, but in, in this critique 
of ourselves, and we want to bring you into uh, understanding that this, uh, folks, but this is not something that one or two people can do. Uh, uh, this is going to take an army mm. to get this done. Uh, the amount of research, the amount of work that needs to be done is uh, we just simply don't have uh, what we need to complete. We're doing a tremendous amount. I think you'd have to agree that we're doing a tremendous amount with what we have. Uh but uh, we want all, we want everyone to know that you're a part of this. Now, coming in and supporting and being a part of this doesn't create some spiritual lineage or you get the same blessings that we do for teaching. We don't see ourselves as being favored by God in any way uh, because we are teaching and sharing this. And so we would be very false in making the pretense that somehow by your support that you are going to be favored along with us. Uh, but the the favor is knowing that you're doing something that's helping people get out of this misery of Christianity. So, uh, Daniel, where are we? What are we going to do? Well, uh, along those lines, if you do want to participate in supporting the gospel revolution and what we're doing in Grace Conferences, look on your screen. Uh, there's some information on there about how you can give uh, financially. Um, or you might say, hey, I've got something that I can maybe help you with uh, because I don't have money. Uh, well, you can, our contact information is on there as well. Give yes. us a call. Contact us. Let us know how you think that you can help us. And we appreciate everybody. Uh, there is specific information in there if you're given in Canada, uh, because our Canada organization, Grace Conferences, uh, is there to help you and to provide a tax deduction for you. Mm -hmm. And then everyone else around the world and in the United States, um, simply just go to gospelrevolution.com and hit donate, and you'll get all that information. And uh, I think we're going to come at you with one more session. Uh, if you said session, uh, we missed some other ones. Well, <laughs> Make sure you look below this video. You'll have all the information of what we've been doing all weekend long here. And uh, hope you've been enjoying this. But we have one more session that we want to come at you with. And uh, so stay tuned for that information. You'll find everything you need to know uh, below this video. We're going to be uh, covering the introduction of the law into all of this. And uh, the, the place that the law held and the prophets and uh, as Jesus told us to examine their work, so that's what we've been doing is going back and examining uh, all of this, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. And uh, the first five books are called the first, uh, the, the books of the law or the books of Moses, if you will. And uh, that's where we've been in most all of this. I, well, I guess I, all of it has been there with the exception of just a couple of quotes that we've gone through. Uh, so, uh, I, I hope that you're seeing this powerful single picture that is developing. And then inside the picture, there's a picture and inside that picture, there's a picture and inside that picture is a picture. It's something that I began to call, uh, uh, 30 years ago, the fractal nature of mm -hmm. the gospel that, uh, because I just began to see that no matter whether I'm talking about sin or righteousness, one is a fractal of the other. If I'm talking about the fulfillment of prophecy, it's a fractal of all of the other subjects. If I'm talking about any part, in, any subject that we are uh, considering, uh, baptism, whatever, we see, we are able to see that all of these subjects are simply small uh, fractals or a place to peer into the big picture. But if you ever hear something that you can't see the big picture in the one subject, just realize that the subject that you're listening to just is not. I don't care how much they encourage you to look through the lens uh, of love to uh, try to see that God uh, was uh, never angry um, you know, just before, uh, just this afternoon, in fact, we were uh, looking online and um, uh, one of the uh, guys uh, came on and put the nice post up. And this is one that's relied on constantly. And I want to mention this before we go off on this particular one with something to remember um, uh, from this. <laughs> There's a whole lot to remember from this. 
but that is the statement. And this is the one that is gone to all the time to try to say that all that we have just shared with you is irrelevant and means nothing. Uh, and, and that's really is what you said. You'd say, Mike, nobody would say what you're saying is irrelevant. It's very powerful and uh, it helps us understand the cross. But see, these are the very same things that we're teaching you here comes along with the same scriptures that tell you how angry God was with the people. But the verse that, of course, that they use is that uh, Jesus said that uh, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Now, that is very true. We're not trying to tell you that's not true. But Jesus wasn't telling you about everybody else's relationship with God because the father only had one son at that time. Mm. When Jesus said, uh, when you see me, you see the father. The relationship you see between me and God is a father-son relationship, which he clearly stated you don't have. So uh, don't let these little tricky uh, turnups on these verses uh, such as that, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, uh, 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 for that very reason, that Jesus was the first begotten and the only begotten of the Father. And then, of course, we have become sons. Now, there are some that are struggling to become sons. We wish you good luck and ask you to come back home to the uh, truth of the gospel and give up this futile attempt to become what you already are. Isn't mm. that good news? That's good news. That's good news for everyone. And uh, in fact, it was uh, Chris uh, Stewart that pointed out to me just the other day that uh, isn't it amazing? I had to go back and check and make sure that this wasn't Abba and this wasn't uh, uh, didn't mean uh, something other than uh, this. But uh, he had pointed out after having gone through and weighing out both sides of this, uh, because he really wanted to know, and he'd asked them questions, he asked us questions, and uh, they basically shut him down when he realized that they realized he had some of the information that we share. They just shut him down, and uh, we kept listening and uh, trying to answer the questions. We don't always do a perfect job at that, but we at least try. And but after he had listened uh, to both sides, boy, his mind just went. Uh, really into a lot of research and things that uh, I've not looked at. And uh, he brought it to my attention. He said, Mike, do you realize, I don't know that he even put it that way. I think he, everything Chris says to me, he says almost in a question way because he is uh, still trying to formulate his own opinions about these things. And he said, I've noticed that uh, every time that Jesus talked about, talked about his relationship with uh, with God, he never called him God. He called him Father. It was always Abba. Every time that Jesus related to him, it was always Abba. And But then when Jesus went to the cross, something happened. Now, we don't understand the depth of this profound thing that happened, but something very profound happened. And suddenly, Jesus could not see himself, one might think, uh, as the son anymore. Because when he was on the cross, he did not cry out, Abba, Abba. He cried out, my God, my God, wow. why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, I really appreciate Chris pointing that out to me. It's a real gem, and it should be to you also that the only time that Jesus referred to uh, God as God instead of Father was when he had felt forsaken on the cross. Mm. Good news. We got more good news coming out the volume you're not about that. I am. And let me give you the interpretation Rewind. of that. We have more good news coming, so stay tuned. <laughs> as I get older, this is going to happen more. So. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody.